Welcome to today's webcast series presentation, Uncomplicating the Stabilization Selection Process, Part 2. My name is Jaden Anderson with Civil Postructural Engineer Media. Thank you for joining this webcast, which is sponsored by Propex. Before we begin today's presentation, first some general information about the webcast and the GoToWebcast platform. The views of the speakers and organizations participating in this webcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Civil Plus Structural Engineer Media or its publisher, Zwei Group. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this webcast, please submit questions or a brief explanation of your technical problem using the question tab on the GoToWebinar control panel and a representative will assist you. During the webcast, you can also submit questions to our speakers using the same question tab. Submit your questions at any time and we will try to answer as many as we can later in the webcast. So I group encourages group learning for our events. If you are viewing the live webcast with the group on one registered person's computer, that person must complete and submit the multiple viewer registration form for the group in order for everyone to earn credit. Download the multiple viewer registration form from the handouts tab on the control panel. Submission instructions are on the form. Viewers of archived webcasts must pass a quiz in order to download a certificate of completion. Today's presenters are Dr. Christopher Thornton and Drew Luazo. Dr. Christopher Thornton currently holds an associate professor position in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and serves as the director of the Re Engineering Research Center and Hydraulics Laboratory at Colorado State University. Dr. Thornton is currently the PI on the United States Army Corps of Engineer full-scale wave overtopping simulation project. This project is intended to simulate waves hitting levees, crashing across the top and accelerating down the backside to see what effect they will have on different types of grass armoring systems. In addition, during the past six years, work conducted at the hydraulics laboratory has been instrumental in defining and developing standards for performance testing of engineered erosion control solutions. Partnerships formed with other resource or research institutions have resulted in interdisciplinary collaborations that have defined frameworks describing the complex problem of soil erosion and stability. Dr. Thornton provides technical expertise to the university and local communities in areas of hydraulics, open channel flow, bioengineering, river mechanics, and erosion control. He supervises hydraulic modeling in areas of river mechanics, dam safety, flow, measurement, erosion and sedimentation, riprap design, bank reverment and stabilization, stream monitoring, environmental aspects of rivers, hydraulic structures and tailings management. Dr. Thornton earned his BS, MS and PDH degrees in civil engineering from Colorado State University. He is a member of ASCE, ASTM, AWRA, ECTC, EWRI and IECA. Drew Luazo graduated at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga with a BS and MS in civil engineering. Luazo's career started at Propex as a civil applications engineer, progressing to an erosion control engineering specialist and is currently the engineering services manager. Luazo led the redesign of Propex's erosion control design application, EC design, and is a licensed engineer in the state of Tennessee. Propex's engineering service CIS department leads the industry in slope stability analysis and design. Erosion control analysis and design as well as testing and field support for erosion control and geosynthetic solutions. Dr. Thornton will be presenting first, so I will hand over the presentation over to him now. All right, Dr. Thornton, we can see your slides and we're ready for you. Thanks, Jaden. Well, good afternoon, morning all, depending on where you're sitting. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, pleased to have the opportunity to present part two of our Uncomplicating the Stabilization Selection Process. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about a lot of the hydraulic testing that we had done and the, the work that's been completed on understanding this interaction of, of performance systems that include vegetation with their soil environment. So 
wanted to go a little bit more in depth today. Uh, it's just a quick outline of some definitions and understandings of the different materials that we'll be talking about. Um, talk about the, some appropriate and not appropriate applications for turf reinforcement mats. Uh, hit on some key components of the durability of TRMs and really talk a fair bit about the installation and maintenance practice. The devil, as we said before, is always in the details and making sure that we get these systems installed properly is paramount to the success of the overall design. And I'd like to finish with a, a design example, actually, illustrating the methodology that we're sort of presenting here today. I'd like to start with the challenge, and, and as engineers and designers and specifiers, I, I always get my soapbox out and say that the impetus is on us. We have to understand the problem, and we have to know what we are asking for in an engineered solution. So very rarely do we have, of course, all of the site information, but we have to get as much as we can. It's imperative that we understand the hydraulic, the geotech, what is our design life, what are the economical or the environmental concerns, and most importantly, the economics, so that we can do as many projects as possible, but also ensure the safety and viability for the, the public with all of our civil infrastructure. Today we're presenting a, a lot of, of methodology and, and information based on successes and failures. We learn more from failures than we do from successes because we have a hard point. So I, I of course, work for Colorado State University, but we're really fortunate that Propex has been willing to provide all of their data to us, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so that we can really understand what we're seeing in the field and how we can correlate that best to the laboratory environment and come up with a methodology that is as, as stringent and repeatable and defendable as possible. So to start, we as the, as the owner have to understand the problem so that we can interpret and select a proper solution. Into the, the product classes that we're going to talk about today, the first, the TRM's turf reinforcement mat, typically a stitch bonded or a heat bonded or a woven product. We say low to moderate tensile strength, meaning that it has well, in the 1,000 up to 1,500 sometimes pounds per square inch tensile strength to it. It's, it's made for a, a lower flow application, if you will, a design life 10, 25 years. You can see from ASTM D3455, the materials that make up turf re, most turf reinforcement mats retain about 80% of their strength after 1,000 hours of that xenon test. Um, as I said, the, the low to moderate flow channels four, five, eight feet per second, um, minor, moderate slopes. You know, you know, we're not talking about spillways or auxiliary channels with these type of applications. More to, to be able to provide that buffer, and I'll show an a illustration of this in a minute, between native vegetation and hard armor. We're working our way through what vegetation can provide and how can we enhance that vegetation under moderate or low stress conditions to provide a, a green alternative to erosion control and stability application. Typical applications of TRMs, you can see just in this collage of pictures on the upper left, it's a hill slope, typically a rain induced. You put it down again to help your vegetation establish and to keep the, the material in place should you get the, the flow. The middle center picture there shows the vegetation beginning to populate that TRM. And, you know, Seen from field applications, it comes in quite quickly and is able to fill in rather fast to, to be able to provide that performance and aesthetic component, whether it be in a channel like we have here in the center or even a, along a, a roadway swale here on the side of this highway embankment. Different applications, again, quickly for, for the TRMs outside of a culvert, just to intermittent flow. They're very good at for, for controlling localized turbulence, I won't say a hydraulic jump, I'll talk about that in the middle in a minute, but just that expansion of flow and, and natural storm flow through that urban drainage system. Uh, vegetation can come up from the bottom, down from the top, again, uh, different installation techniques to be able to ensure that you have the sandwiching of the TRM in between the veg and the soil. See you there on the bottom right, just a finished slope as the vegetation's coming in and providing protection to that embankment and certainly the aesthetic appeal of that design. 
High performance TRMs now we're moving up in the the ability to resist higher flows, higher velocities, higher shear stresses. Uh, typically, they're a woven three-dimensional polypropylene matrix, um, high tensile strength up to 3,000 pounds per foot to be able to withstand the non-hydraulic stresses, which are really important and we'll, we'll, we'll spend a good bit of time talking about today. Um, UV stabilized, uh, they've been shown, and I'll present the plot, up to 75 years of design life. Uh, we've seen 90% retained after 6,000 hours of ASTM D4355. So it, it has additives in the polypropylene to be able to ensure that UV stability, much higher tensile strength for non-hydraulic stresses and hydraulic performance, as we talked about last time, in uh, high flow channels, steep slopes, severe stress, uh, shear stresses in the upper teens and low 20s and vegetated velocities uh, upwards of, of 22, 23 feet per second. So again, a, a step up in technology, if you will, to provide reinforcement and protection under much higher flow conditions. Some examples of TRMs on a slope, you can see on the upper right here in Florida, it's a, a very steep slope that the TRM's holding the vegetation to around this outlet channel, auxiliary uh, release of a dam. Uh, bottom right picture is that emergency release spillway just being covered with the TRM as that vegetation is getting ready to establish. So we're able to incorporate these types of solutions into areas where we would have more common flow and also um, higher velocity, steeper slope, higher energy flow conditions. The next step up then is the Engineered Earth Armoring Systems, EEAS, the, the designated acronym. Um, it consists of a high performance TRM, again, a, a high tensile strength material with an uh, Engineered Earth Percussion Anchor provides another tool now to our box to be able to incorporate geotechnical stability, slope stabilization with erosion control. Um, talked last time of great success with these, these installations in critical structures where there is turbulence, where there is some energy dissipation requirement other than just friction of the roughness of the system itself. Uh, certainly with wave overtopping on the front and protected side, as I said, slope stabilization, we're able to do a geotechnical out analysis and incorporate the spacing and depth of the anchor appropriate for each individual site, which uh, Drew will, will highlight here in our design example. Uh, underwater protection, uh, uh, permanent stability for it underwater in areas where vegetation doesn't, isn't going to establish below the ordinary high water level uh, to be able to, again, provide that anchoring of the TRM to the underlying soil. We've seen a higher factor of safety, meaning that the inclusion of these anchor systems help the hydraulic performance as well as the slope stability of the site. So we've seen a, a statistically significant increase in the uh, uh, available resistance to shear stress and velocity by the incorporation of these anchors. The goal, of course, is to have reinforced vegetation. Uh, back to the re and Palmer days of, of late 40s, early 50s of, of the standard of what different types of vegetation and different qualities of vegetation can withstand from flowing water, we want to be able to improve that. We want to incorporate vegetation into more of our designs, reduce the carbon footprint, increase the water quality, provide a more stable, aesthetically um, pleasing component to, to the, the civil infrastructure designs. EPA has a fact sheet out actually on the uh, turf reinforcement mat showing what they're able to do for water quality and carbon footprint and just sort of a summary of the benefits of being able to incorporate vegetation into the erosion control arena. So some quickly some of the applications that have been very well suited for sort of low tech to high tech swales and stormwater channels as I showed you with the TRMs, low flow applications, pretty flat slopes you want to get vegetation native, whether it's on the East Coast where you have to mow it <laughs> two times a week or whether it's out in Colorado where it's very sparse at best and, and provide the right system approach to being able to protect each individual channel. Uh, geotechnically stable slopes, as I said, with the anchors incorporating that spacing in depth. You see the picture on the right, right is very important in a couple of aspects. One, it, it shows the, the ability to incorporate this type of technology around structures, whether it be a bridge abutment or an inlet culvert, um, drainage 
urban drainage type environment. And riprap, you see here at the toe of the slope, you have to have something to protect below the ordinary high water level. So often a TRM or an HPTRM or an EAS is, is the component of the overall design that has to be incorporated into the other pieces to ensure, ensure overall project stability and success. Canal ponds and lake banks, again, for lapping waves, um, able to dissipate the energy with the vegetation, provide a water quality benefit for filtration, both directions on a pond bank. Uh, emergency spillways, while we very rarely would put a, an emergency spillway as a fully vegetated system, certainly the components of that. Auxiliary spillways, we have seen some incorporation through NRCS of their lower hazard applications looking at, at the, the viability of using earth reinforced systems, vegetation systems on those auxiliary spillways. Great success with levees, dams. Um, the, a lot of what we know about vegetation, Jordan mentioned the, the Corps of Engineers wave overtopping study is what's come out of that effort. Uh, for New Orleans, for Jacksonville, for the manufacturers that have contributed, we've learned an awful lot about the ability of these systems to adapt and react to dynamic as well as steady state forces and those type of applications. Some areas too, like I said, you learn more from failures than you do from su su successes where they're not appropriate because either common sense tells you or we just don't have data yet to be able to ship to prove that yes, this actually does work. Trop structures, uh, actual pipe outlets where you have a, a large flow coming out of the, the pipe, energy dissipation, hydraulic jumps. Areas where we have a third dimension of, of flow, meaning a hydraulic jump where you have a roller and you have that vertical component of velocity. We, we just don't have the data yet to be able to stand behind using these types of, of systems in these applications. So at, at this juncture, Stop, shy away from those. There's other, there's other systems that are better suited for some of these higher energy unknown applications. Um, constant flow and with primary spillways with long duration flows, the vegetation drowns. So we have to understand the hydrology and our, our I would argue, ever changing climate conditions and what do we expect as this 20 to 10 to 75 year design life, depending on what the, the importance of the project is, what's our trend in, in the hydraulic conditions, hydrologic conditions over that period of time and what could we expect to happen over the course of the life of a specific project? So first question of course is which one do you pick? You want, as I said, economics are important, right? So you wanna be able to optimize performance and economics on any project. That's that's what we do. They don't teach us that in engineering school, but <laughs> by golly, that's what we do when we get out. So we have to be able to select between the stitch bonded, the high performance TRM, or when in fact do you need the EEAS system to be able to provide that combination of geotechnical stability and increased hydraulic performance. I said about the, the sort of the hierarchy was, of course, got this, this slide from Propex, but they've done a good job of showing sort of the pyramid of possibility, if you will, of do nothing or unreinforced vegetation, as I said about the re Palmer work that was done decades ago now that we still, we still specify against. And then sort of knowing what your stresses are, your hydraulic stresses, the landlock, the pyramid, the armor max, different product names for different levels of performance. What's the hydraulic condition, site conditions that I have? What do I expect my non-hydraulic loadings to be? And what's the risk of being wrong? That's really what it boils down to is I have to make an awful lot of assumptions as an engineer on any given project. And what happens if I'm wrong? will often dictate where on a, a protection pyramid we really want to land. Talked about hydraulic stresses, but again, the importance of, of what we want to talk about today is the non-hydraulic. We want to be able to ensure that over the life of the project, it performs. So it's many of these vegetated systems see flow in a rather infrequent period of their time, but they still have to be maintained. They still have to have access, provide access to different components of civil infrastructure. So we have to be able to understand what that non-hydraulic stress component 
could be in determining where we want to land on this protection pyramid. Um, certainly, the the hydraulic and velocity we've or velocity and shear stress we've talked a lot about, but the, for the non-hydraulic specifically, design life, anticipated wildlife impact, and permanent securement, meaning that we're able to hold that material down. The pins don't are there to get vegeta vegetation established. Excuse me. The anchored systems for the EEAS, either underwater where you won't get vegetation to grow, or to ensure that the system stays intact, that you've sandwiched everything together and you're providing that combination of hydraulic and geotechnical support, which is the, the key component of the earth anchored systems. So you can see just with the pictures, of course, velocity and shear stress, but then the loading, the backfilling of a TRM installation, we can have quite substantial non-hydraulic forces. So the $65 million question is durability. How do we assess durability? How do we come up with a comparative methodology that would allow us to determine even what durability is? In the context of where we are today, the information that, that we have to work from based on laboratory work and, and field observation and testing, which we'll talk about, we're able to begin to put together that definition of what durability would be based upon. Certainly exposure, ultraviolet resistance, uh, we need to have the combination, as I said, of, of field environment and laboratory testing. Um, the, the end is what we really want is that ultimate tensile strength. It's, it's a function of the quality that goes into the material. The polypropylene that makes up these mats is, of course, just like anything, re recycled or not. So there's a different quality associated with each of the filaments and fibers that are used to manufacture these. And so those material properties, as specified through ASTM, are extremely important in understanding the QAQC of the manufacturing project to be able to ensure that these stresses are protected against. Uh, heavy mowing, maintenance, debris loading, we'll talk about in a second. Animal loading, meaning walk cows. Boy, you'd be surprised with NRCS how many problems they have on a lot of their low hazard dams because of cows. They go to the same place to drink every day and just tear up areas that they walk through. So hoof traffic and burrowing of animals, being able to provide resistance against that, but also selecting systems should you have species that could potentially be entrapped and endangered because of these, these types of products. We don't want to incorporate um, danger into the system for, for wildlife applications. So with the UV resistance, it's really important. And it's more so probably here in the West than it is in the East because the sun shines 300 days a year here. But they in introduce antioxidants uh, to increase the stability. And there's really the, the whole point is to retain the tensile strength so that you still have the material properties after 10,000 hours, pick a number, of, of life expectancy that will provide resistance to your hydraulic and your non-hydraulic stresses. Back to the first slide about the, the emphasis is on us as the engineers and designers and specifiers to understand what that means. Is it an area that's gonna see traffic? Is it potent, not traffic today? But boy, if we develop this area, this is gonna be a, a highly used trafficked area. So we have to understand again what the overall project the evolution is gonna look like. Um, the, said the importance of, of testing through D4355, you know, it's able to accelerate exposure by the, the light test and, and provide extrapolations, if you will, out to a, a, a large exposure time period. But just like with anything, it's really important then to verify that back against field performance to make sure that you're, just like we do in the laboratory of hydraulic testing, to make sure that that durability indicator is tracking from the lab to the actual field. So one of the data sets that was made available to us here to evaluate in this context was uh, Bell Road in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a pyramid installation was put in in early 2000s and has been, as you can see through the uh, chronologic series of pictures here, developing vegetation ever since. Um, over the course of the past, oh, probably 
12 years, I think we go back with data, we've been able to take samples and test them, bring five, eight, 10 samples back a year and bring them into the laboratory and run the tensile strength tests on them, the material property tests on them to be able to quantify what sort of effect the exposure in probably the highest solar radiated part of the country would be. So the results of that show that if I combine many, many um, laboratory tests with the available field test, we get this plot up here on the top that shows the exposure and the tensile strength. Now it's really hard, of, as you know, to be able to say with 100% certainty what's gonna happen after 50 or 75 years, just like hydrology, the 100 year flow event, right? But we're able to correlate the shape of this curve based on both sets of data. So it takes the laboratory data coupled with the field data to be able to provide an estimation of what that curve degradation curve, if you will, is going to look like with time. And you can see then it's plotted against the three different types of, of starting durability, essentially, of products. So again, understanding what we have on a project-specific basis will allow us to be able to best select the material and the system to provide the stability that we need. But why, are that, why is that important? Again, functionally boots on the ground, what does that mean? Maintenance, the mowing, having large pieces of equipment, not being, certainly not getting rutted, but also not catching the material and pulling it up and getting it caught in the blades and, and actually having something worse than, than what you started. The installation, you can see with this uh, tractor front end loader, it's a heck of a load on the tires as you're going up and down your slope to provide that backfilling. The material on that slope has to be able to withstand that installation and then maintenance loading. Talked about the wildlife impact, um, double-edged sword. You can see on the, on the left side here, there's a, a area where pyramid is installed and immediately, it's kind of eerie, immediately off where the installation of pyramid is, the snake holes. I don't know about you, but I hate snakes, so I'll, I'll walk on a protected surface. But you can't put something out there that the snakes could get caught in and entangled in. So a netted prod product in an environment where you have species that could potentially be entrapped is certainly a, a problem or, or a consideration that needs to be evaluated. Picture on the bottom right, just not all work's done in a laboratory. This was out in the field in Louisiana where they buried garbage underneath different TRMs and HPTRMs and let the hogs come in at night. And they, if you know anything about wild hogs, they're quite an animal. They don't give up, but they did with the, the pyramid system. They just decided it was more trouble and it was worth to chew through that and went and found the garbage that was buried under more of the stitch bonded uh, lower tensile strength systems. It's, a, it's not very often you see a test report like that, but that's a, a fun one to read. Debris loading is really important, and we've, we've learned a lot, as I said, the information that's been made available to us to help put this methodology together. Um, this is a, a Propex stitch bonded product that hydraulically performed just fine but it was the tree branch that you can see bounce down through this channel and you could back up the rolling of that log where it hit on that channel and damaged the mat. Now it can be repaired, but it, it really compromised the stability of that area. We realized that and thought, okay, when we get down here to these levees and start looking at the hydraulic performance of these, we need to add another component to our analysis matrix because as you can see on the pen levee following Ike, I believe it was, there was a lot of debris that came over that. Brushed off the vegetation, but the system's still intact. We didn't lose levee, we lost grass. Blade grass, not even necessarily the roots. So that vegetation is gonna be able to self-heal, reestablish relatively quickly because the stability of the embankment has been retained and maintained. I talked about the mechanical loading. A lot of geotechnical analysis can be done for the improved factor of safety um, and then providing those connection anchors as we've shown provides a, a much greater 
hydraulic, unvegetated hydraulic performance also. There's a number of agencies that have realized that this is important. It's not just CSU and um, folks from PROPEX that are saying that this is, these are important parameters. Federal Highway Administration, FPO3, um, has in their specifications for construction of road and bridges the importance of 3,000 pounds per foot or greater of tensile strength because of the high amount of maintenance that is required around highway structures. Federal Highway realized that they're going to have tractors and carts and access vehicles out on these installations. Corps of Engineers, again, the index properties that you see here, they've, they've uh, highlighted and specify now for their HPTRMs and have a set for their TRMs also so that they in, they're ensured that they have the stability and strength that they're starting with that could be evaluated then over the course of the project life. South Florida Water Management District has taken it into their application and want to understand what their range of applicability was so that they could develop their own set of specifications and what they require to be the inherent initial properties of a TRM or an HPTRM. So there's, there's go-bys out there. We're not starting from scratch. There's other organizations and great minds that have gotten their head around this and, and understood the overall global issue and been able to put together these recommendations. So just as a summary picture, the importance of, of durability, you can see the degradation of the product on the left just because of, of sunlight, um, UV breakdown there in the center, and as I said about mowers catching, this is a, a not a, a high tensile strength product that got caught up in the blades of the mower and just actually shredded the the embankment. So there's act, there's no protection there now should that T-wall be overtopped and, and water flow down the backside of that levee. So I said before, the devil's in the details. You know, when we test something here in the laboratory, the, the students do an excellent job of making sure that every manufacturer's recommendation is followed. And while I know that's always the case in the field, sometimes maybe it isn't. So the, the details of, of how it's installed are, are very important, and the procedures that are documented by the manufacturers of these systems should really be adhered to because it's the, the school of hard knocks is what got those documents produced. Um, site preparation, again, we have to understand what the soil is. I'm not going to get vegetation to grow in a, a lime-based soil or a, a very sandy soil isn't going to be able to, to hold a, a very tight root structure. So understanding what our basic soil conditions are at the site are certainly important. Knowing what our access points are, uh, where we're going to construct from, start at one end, work our way back, or, or work over top of the material would determine, again, a, a non-hydraulic stress. Um, typically, we recommend that the soil's compacted per the engineer's recommendation for stability of the embankment. Um, smooth and uniform so that you can get the mat put down, but also recommend that it's just lightly scarified on top. ASTM 6460 actually specifies for the testing, and we took this from a field installation manual, was to scarify the top half inch so that you have a seed base, so you have something for vegetation to start through. Those of you with patios, you know dandelions will grow out of concrete, so it's able to put roots through pretty tight material, but it has to have something to start with. Those seeds have to germinate. Once they germinate, they're able to do their job and really penetrate into the soil material, whatever it, whatever it is to support that vegetation. Certainly amendments, again, site-specific. Um, depending on, on what the soil conditions are and what the, the growth time expect, expectation for the vegetation is. I typically recommend applying a portion of the seed below and above. We found when we did the testing that doing that gave us just belt and suspenders. We got vegetation growing up through the mat and vegetation growing down through the mat and really provided a certainly a good interface of stability, but also time-wise ensured the, the timely establishment of vegetation. Sort of starting from the beginning to, to excavate your trenches around the perimeter. The top of slope, you typically hang the, an anchor trench at the top and roll the material down the slope. Um, talk about that, it's sort of like you put 
when you put roof shingles on, you want to shingle the direction that the flow, you would expect the water to run off your roof. Same thing with wind and wave attack. You can certainly fight the wind and, and put the, roll these materials out, but it's quite a sail sometimes when you do that. So thinking about the prevailing wind and or wave attack and, and how you're going to install it so that you overlap it appropriately, tied it at the top, trenched in at the bottom, certainly on the sides, and if it's a channel application, the beginning and end of that channel. It doesn't really matter what the, the erosion control application is. If it's not keyed in properly, anything from rock to roller reinforced concrete, it's not going to work very well. You have to have those termination trenches well designed and, and well implemented to ensure the stability and keeping the water up on top where you'd want it. Typically, the panels, it comes in rolls, uh, rolled erosion control, so that it's manufactured and shipped in rolls. Typically, overlap three or four inches. You don't want to get too much overlap so that you don't have too thick of an area for vegetation, but you want enough overlap that you're able to anchor the systems together. We found, again, with vegetation establishment that that three, four inch overlap range is, is about the sweet spot for tying the panels together. And then pin, once it's down, in the the pattern that's recommended by the manufacturer. You can see from this schematic, it's an anchor and a pin pattern. The, the anchors are typically staggered to provide that stability, and the pins are more of a complementary pattern, meaning it's more of a uniform pattern throughout the, the width of the, and length of the installation. Now, these patterns can change, again, depending on, on recommendations from individual manufacturers and incorporating the individual tests that they've done. Some folks have looked at long staples and higher density of staples and different type of staples or pins to be able to provide that different level of performance at different times along with the project life. And as I said, just a, a picture now of how that's implemented in the field, the complementary pins you can see at the pattern that they are in the center of that picture at the overlap seam and then the staggered anchors at their predetermined predetermined locations. Certainly around a radius as possible. Uh, channels are very rarely straight. Not much in, in nature is. You can see the, the curve at the bottom of the channel on the left and then the radius being formed on the right with the, the mats unvegetated just by under, knowing what that, that cut line is and following that down your slope to ensure that at the end of the installation you have everything tied into your anchor trench at the top. You can see three anchor trenches here, one on the left, one up at the top, and one down at the bottom to hold this system together and provide the erosion and geotechnical stability for this slope. The anchors are, are straightforward to put in. Uh, it's, ex it's extremely important to do it properly. Um, typically, again, at that, at that predetermined depth, it dictates how many of the setting rods you have to use. Um, need the right driver to get the mechanical advantage and technique and setting, it's important to have your angle prop properly set. The best, of course, is horizontal because you're cutting back in all the way through the surface. But normal to the slope provides the optimum level of performance for both slope stability and hydraulic. If you get vertical, you're not really doing anything at all. So that normal, normal to the uh, place slope is, is paramount to the success of the anchor from geotechnical and hydraulic standpoint. Once the anchors are in QAQC, you got to walk back and walk the site and check it. Make sure that you don't have areas that are missing anchors or pins that got just forgotten or areas where you need a few more. So a lot of times with radiuses, it's a flexible mat, so you're able to to anchor that radius together a little bit better by locally increasing, based on a field inspection, the density of anchors and or pins. But that's an important component after the installation is to do the QAQC of the inspection of, okay, we drew it out on AutoCAD, is that really what was followed? Last thing is for the installation is to get the, back tr the trenches backfilled, top trench, bottom trench, smooth out your surface if you're Using that trench as a cutoff, then you would have where that excavator is, another set of mats coming downstream from that. Um, but go back and, and backfill and form those trenches appropriately. 
Sometimes you'll see with the seeding, whether it's seed or sod, as we said with seed, put half on the bottom, half on top. Uh, sod we found with the wave over topping was amazing, um, but it's expensive. So it's not, again, the risk of being wrong. You're not always going to be able to use sod. Uh, hydro mulch, we've seen great success with not only vegetation establishment, but day one performance of, you can see in the left spraying the mulch on top of a, a steep slope, and then that infill provides a crust for the vegetation to have a little incubator, essentially, to begin to germinate and establish and grow. And belt and suspenders, if you, start, if you get a, a flow condition before your vegetation actually gets established. Um, sometimes ECBs are put over the top, again, just to help with that establish. That's a biodegradable product you see there, but it's going to allow that vegetation to have its incubator, to have a little bit of nutrient and have a little bit of cover moisture retention to be able to establish and be viable for the overall design of the system. At the end, we want vegetation. That's really what this boils down to. We want to have a green, hard armored system. On the left, you can see again, a, a, a steep slope with just natural vegetation. On the right, that's a sod installation, a, a, an area where the aesthetics were very important. The access was very important. So the sod was put down over the TRM. The point is, if we follow the steps and the methodology for selecting the proper system, considering the hydraulic and non-hydraulic stress, we can ensure that the end product or the end result is a viable solution for the duration of the design life. Knowing all that, I've been able to put together a design example, an actual project that Drew's going to walk us through and, and talk about these different decision points and how that affects the selection of the material and the overall system. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'll take over from here. Um, this example we're going to go through is just to show that the process that Chris laid out, the, the process that we follow at Propex to understand the, pro the problems or challenges for a project and try to find the best solution for all those challenges. Um, so as, uh, as Chris mentioned, th this is the final result. We're looking to get to a stabilized, erosion, controlled, and vegetated solution. Um, this project specifically was up in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma a couple years ago, um, where we were looking to, to find, again, the best solution for erosion and slope stability and just walk through this process um, ultimately, what we started with is uh, a channel, a stream bank, excuse me, that was uh, experiencing a lot of erosion. Um, they had used different solutions in the past, some rock riprap and concrete. Um, some areas have been more successful than others, um, but a lot of areas needed, uh, needed to be restored and uh, remediated uh, due to that erosion and instability. So we worked with the engineer to try to understand sort of where they're looking at using it. You can see the different sections here or the different plan views um, where this is where we ended up. But uh, along the way, we're trying to figure out um, with the different geometries, different uh, uh, variations in slope height and gradient, um, with the soil we had on site and with the hydraulics, what, what really was needed to solve these problems. So the first step was to look at the hydraulics. Um, so when we do a hydraulic analysis, um, we really look at open channel flow, and based on the geometry, um, the the bed slope, uh, the flow rate, uh, we can then start to understand what um, velocities and shear stress we can anticipate for that area. So for this scenario with the different geometries, we were able to find out that we had around uh, just below 12 feet per second, 11.6 feet per second of velocity and around 4.1 PSF of shear stress, which is what we could anticipate. Now, you see these uh, results here. This is from our EC design analysis that we went through and, and ran the, the model on to understand. And based on the soils we had and the vegetation we were expecting, we believed that we could get these performance values for these four different products. So Landlock 450, Pyramat 25, Pyramat 75, and then Armamax 75. You see the progression there. So ultimately, if it was just based on these hydraulics, Landlock 450 could have been sufficient. Um, so that was the first step is we, we know these four products could be hydraulically sufficient and provide that performance we need against erosion. The second step, you can go 
right direction. All right, we'll go with that way. The, the, the next step was to look at the, the non-hydraulic considerations. So uh, if we have all the hydraulics considered, well, what about maintenance, uh, wildlife impact, whether it's entrapped potential or um, debris, uh, debris loading, uh, and then required design life. So as we went through these and asked these different questions, we found that while Landlock 450 hydraulically could work, it didn't meet all the non-hydraulic considerations. And the same thing for PMAT 25. It uh, does well in, in the maintenance and the uh, wildlife impact portion, but um, we felt that the, the debris was just too much. They wanted a longer design life than what we could provide with PRMAT 25. So we had then at that point two options, PRMAT 75 or Armour Max 75. Well, the next step was understanding the, the geotechnical component of it. So with the soils we had on site, um, running a stability model, we found that in an unreinforced state, uh, the factors of safety were not adequate. Uh, we had a couple of different scenarios we were looking to consider, and this shows an example of the one-to-one -one slopes, where the desired factory safety was a 1.3. Um, based on this analysis, we are able to see that uh, incorporating armor max with the B2 anchors six foot long on a four foot by three foot spacing and 1,000 pounds of pull-up resistance, we were able to get to a 1.3 factor of safety. So while PMR 75 could have uh, provided the hydraulic and non-hydraulic um, requirements, uh, we, we can't provide the stability with just the PMAT HPTRM. So the, the engineered earth armoring system Armamax was selected. This shows a, a cross-section how we uh, use the Armamax along the one-to-one -one slopes. Um, you notice, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, that uh, it's not just armor max. On the bottom, you have some uh, armored units and some rock uh, for the stabilization at the toe. Um, TRMs, HVTRMs, and even engineered earth armoring systems uh, have their applications, and they have areas where we need to work in combination with other systems. So this is a good example of those uh, two different types of systems working together. See the installation on the left-hand side with uh, smaller anchors on the flatter slopes and the larger anchors on the right on the steeper slopes uh, being installed there. You see the, the progression on the installation where you, you have the armor max installed along the side slopes around some of the existing trees uh, with the rock armoring at the toe. This is in uh, October of 2013. For vegetation, uh, this one, they soil filled it and follow that with a hydro seed application. And follow that with the application of an erosion control blanket. Um, typically on channel applications where you have channelized flow, uh, temporary erosion control blankets are used just to provide that immediate protection during vegetation establishment. Now the next spring vegetation is starting to establish. Uh, this is here in April. Following up the next month in May, you can see the vegetation uh, becoming more and more full. And then this is that following year. So a year later, uh, vegetation establishing well, the application of, of vegetation as well as native seeds being uh, deposited and, and establishing there as well. A couple different sections here. Again, you see that the natural stream being restored. Uh, this is a, a geotechnically stabilized slope with erosion control preventions. Uh, and really all you see is vegetation. A couple more shots where um, you also notice that this is in the background of a neighborhood. So this goes right through a uh, residential uh, area. And uh, so safety is important uh, and performance is important. Uh, also aesthetics and environmental uh, performance is, is there too. So again, we went through the hydraulics, the non-hydraulic considerations, and the geotechnical stability to get to that final solution. So with that, um, we appreciate your time. Uh, we'll, we'll be going through questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them out in the, the questions section there.
And so what we'll do is, uh, just like we did on the last um, first part of the webinar, um, as you go through the questions, uh, if we need clarification, we'll ask. And Chris and I both will, will try to tag team these answers uh, as best as possible. So the, the first question uh, is, uh, did we evaluate the hydraulic performance changes over the course of vegetation establishment? That's a good question. Um, the, yes, for projects you do want to do that, and and where that comes into play is uh, even on the uh, first first part of the webinar series, we showed that the range of Manning's end values. So you you need to evaluate that range so that you're able to use the lowest Manning's end to essentially compute your highest velocity and the highest Manning's end to compute your freeboard or flow stage at a given discharge. So yes, being able to evaluate the, the performance over a range of roughness values as that vegetation establishes is important so that you understand the, the whole picture of the hydraulic components. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, can an, an ECB, an erosion control blanket, be installed on top of a TRM for a temporary basis? Um, I'd say definitely. We, we actually use that combination pretty regularly. Um, one way of vegetation establishment is to install your, your TRM, soil fill it with, say, half inch to an inch of soil and seed, and then we'll very often use a, a rose control blanket for temporary protection of that seed just while the vegetation establishes. Once the vegetation is there, the roots have grown, grown down into the uh, TRM, and so that root structure is then reinforced. So that's a very, very common application to use those two together. Um, the next question is, uh, what kind of maintenance of the vegetation are you planning for to deal with debris and falling trees? Let me read that again, make sure I, I follow it. What kind of maintenance of vegetation are you planning for to deal with debris and falling trees? Um, so I might need some clarification on that one. Um, so in my perspective, the, the maintenance and debris are sort of separate. Um, uh, if uh, there is debris or fallen trees, you know, the, the falling trees can affect the roots and you know, pull up the, the section of the slope, which could have some some problems. But uh, debris. Um, you know, we try to design uh, from two perspectives. One, if we can eliminate debris and pull that debris out so it doesn't cause any more problems, that's ideal, but also try to design understanding that that could not happen. We could have debris in there all the time. So if there is a situation where we believe, you know, more of a, a stream application where you have debris or some type of uh, material that could be washing down the stream, um, we, we try to use a material that is more durable that can resist those potential loading from that, that uh, debris. Uh, there's one question about the PowerPoint presentation. We'll, uh, we'll have this posted after the, uh, the webinar, the recorded version. Uh, the next question was, uh, why does Pyramid have different tensile strength capacities? So uh, 4,000 pounds by 3,000 pounds. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, Pyramat is a woven material, which means it's bi-directional, has strength in a machine direction and a cross machine direction. So the machine direction is along the length of the roll, uh, the cross machine is across it. And so there are typically two strengths because uh, it's uh, there's a different density of yarns in different directions. That's how we get the structure and shape of the material. And so the machine direction along the length of the roll has 4,000 pounds per foot of tensile strength. And the cross machine direction, which is uh, across the roll, width um, has a, a tensile strength of 3,000 pounds per foot. Uh, the next question says, our biggest concern has been related to promoting growth. So at our last section, it was suggested that seating above was more successful than seating below the TRM. Um, what about, uh, right, so, so I guess, sorry, that was a, a, a comment. Um, there are lots of different methods. Uh, I noticed some questions down below about different arid applications. Um, there are probably five to six different types of vegetation establishment methods that are pretty common. Um, and while there are lots of different methods, um, typically 
uh, one is used in, in one region. Uh, there's not a whole lot of time where you go back and forth. Um, it's found that one method works well in an area and it's sort of, uh, it's gone gone with and used that, that method pretty pretty commonly. So uh, the next question was, uh, and this will go along with that, uh, what about establishing vegetation in arid areas? Can you hydro seed on top of the TRM? Um, you can hydro seed on top of the TRM, but we've seen in arid applications uh, better success hydro seeding below the TRM. Uh, the reason for that is in arid applications you don't have the same uh, rainfall events. Uh, it's typically pretty dry. And unless you have irrigation, when you hydro seed on top, that seed tends to dry out pretty quickly and it is uh, unprotected. So when we hydro seed below, that mat helps retain the moisture um, that is there and it protects it during the vegetation establishment. So that's just one example of where a regional, a region specific vegetation method has been uh, seen over the years. Uh, the next question says, uh, hey, you explain the app. I just wanted to say something just really quick. We are coming up pretty close on our hour mark. So let's just take one more question and then we'll need to wrap up. But I wanted to let everyone know that um, I will be sending these questions to our presenters today and then they will be available on our website in a couple of days as well. So um, let's take one more and then we will wrap this up. Okay, um, the next question says, what does the end of the structural anchors look like? How do they achieve desired pullout resistance? Uh, so uh, we have three different types of anchors, um, but they're all uh, they all consist of the same components. Um, it's really uh, it's fully assembled, but on the bottom you have an anchor head, uh, which is the portion that's driven into the soil slope. Then you have the, the anchor tendon, which connects the anchor head to the top piece, which is the load bearing plate. Uh, the load bearing plate will sit on the surface, and so essentially you drive the anchor through the high performance turf reinforcement mat. And once you drive it, the anchor head is uh, perpendicular to the slope face. Once it's there to the embedment depth, you'll remove the drive rod, which was used to insert the anchor, and you'll slightly post tension the cable. As you pull on that cable, the foot of the anchor head, which is embedded in the soil, will start to catch, and that anchor head will rotate and it'll go from perpendicular to the slope face to parallel with the slope face. Once you do that and have that rotation, that, ro that anchor can start to catch on the soil and start to compress that soil and develop resistance. Uh, the resistance of that anchor is a function of the anchor size and your soils. So if you have uh, good, strong, high strength soils, you're gonna have a lot higher capacity. And same idea, if you have poor, weak soils, then you have uh, lower or less uh, pull-out capacity. And so when we design it from a slope stability perspective, um, we try to uh, anticipate that strength or that capacity based on your subgrade soils. Okay, so that's all the questions we're gonna take right now. There are a lot more, um, and we will be putting those together in a PDF to put on our website. Um, thank you both, Chris and Drew, for your presentation and for answering all those questions. Um, I have a few more slides that I need to go through really quick, and then we will wrap this up. Okay, um, as we finish, please make sure to download your certificate of completion now from the handouts tab in the control panel. If you missed our note at the beginning and you are watching the live webcast with the group on one person's computer, please download the multiple viewer registration form, which is also under the handouts tab. We need this information in case you are audited and we are contacted to verify this continuing education activity. There will be screenshots at the end of this presentation of your control panel to help you navigate these handouts. Additionally, this webcast has been recorded and it will be hosted on csengineermag.com slash continuing education. A PDF will be available with the answers to all the questions submitted during today's webcast. Please visit csengineermag.com slash continuing education in two to three business days to view or download the complete Q&A for this webcast. And again, thank you so much, Drew and Chris, for joining us today. I think we all got a lot from that. There certainly um, was a lot of engagement, um, and we are very, very excited that we were able to learn so much about this today. I was happy to participate. Thank you.
Thank you guys and thank you to Propex for this presentation and for all of our attendees who joined us and that ends today's webcast.